Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Yao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into a great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Hey, Sandra, good to have you on the show. Hey, Jeremy, good to be here. I'm so excited to share your journey in fintech, and it's been quite a journey for you. I mean, all around the world, from Europe to Malaysia to Singapore and Southeast Asia. So it's quite the journey you have. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, true. Happy to talk about it. (laughs) So I remember interning a long time ago on the construction side in Brandenburg uh, and eating a ton of sauerkraut and sausages. And, <laughs> you know, it's a world away from Southeast Asia. So we've got to ask, how did you get from there to here? Well, I finished my master's in uh, early 2013. And my master's was in Arab world studies with a focus on Islamic finance. And uh, obviously, Malaysia is a very, very good place to be for Islamic finance. So I went there in 2013, initially to work for an Islamic REIT, and then for a private equity real estate uh, company dealing also in Islamic finance. Before that, I was working in banking for a couple of years in Germany already. And uh, then after Malaysia, I moved to Singapore about four and a half years ago in 2016 to work in the fintech sector. So I was hired to set up a fintech company, a peer-to-peer lending company in, in Singapore when the fintech system was still relatively early stage compared to what it is now. And after that, you went on to? After that, I uh, went on to work for Cardup, which I joined about three years ago. Cardup is a card enablement platform in uh, Singapore, and we have also launched in Hong Kong and Malaysia. I think it's very similar to Plastique in the US, uh, in case some of your listeners also know that market very well. Oh, Plastique is doing really well in the US. Uh, so I am sure that if mm-hmm. you're this localizing its core business model, I'm sure it's going to be a tremendously successful company because uh, a lot of the similar dynamics are, you know, in terms of the consumer desires and the market. So we'll get into that soon. So you've really been, you know, really focused on really this finance side of it, you know, as a generalist in across different functions, but definitely with an interesting focus on not just the finance, but the emerging trends like Islamic finance all the way to like, peer-to-peer invoice financing, and now for card payments platforms. So what draws you to this finance and to being on the you know, leading edge of it? Well, having worked in, in the banking and finance sector for about 20 years, I think you start realizing the, the major pain, point, uh, pain points that you're dealing with. So a couple of years ago, when I was uh, deciding to move into the fintech sector, I was really intrigued by all the different solutions that different companies were working on to make the experience for consumers, but also businesses much better. And when you think back like five, six years ago, or just five, and six, or five six years ago, how we made cross-border transfers, how we paid smaller expenses and also bigger expenses was very different to how it is now. And uh, there are still a lot of changes going on. I think a lot of opportunities opening up now. So it's just a very exciting area and space to be in. I'm kind of curious about how you fell into finance as a role, I mean, as a passion or at least as a vocation, because, you know, so many people are like, oh, fintech and finance is hot. I need to do this. It's a surefire thing. And a lot of people just can't get into it, right? Because it's interesting to enter the world of working at banks, working at finance offices. So I'm just kind of curious what brought you in there in the first place on a personal level. Yeah. So banking, that was a very early, early choice that I made. And it was just, I think uh, almost 20 years ago, it was just a, a steady, solid job to have. And you want to make your parents happy and you, you start working in a bank. But then I also realized that in, if you work in a traditional bank, your career path gets very narrow and you become a specialist very soon. And 
at least for my part, I wasn't interested in in that. I didn't. I never wanted to to specialize too much in in one specific area of a big bank or of a bank in general. So when I worked in Malaysia, and it was it still had that Islamic finance component again. My aim was also to become much more of a generalist, like really understand the broader area. And I think that's extremely important uh, when you work in the sector in fintech. You need to be able to to understand what's going on in the market, what is shaping the industries, uh, what are the pain points that you're trying to solve. And if you are too much of a specialist there, that will hurt you, especially in the beginning of the or especially when you come in into an earlier stage uh, company, like later on, when companies grow, they need to have certain structures in place again. And the specialists are obviously very relevant then. But especially in the beginning, try to make sure that you really understand as much as you can from how everything works. Were there any challenges in making that transition from what you just described? from joining the traditional banking side to becoming more of a specialist and a generalist at a leading age? Definitely. I think when you are when you have a couple of experience in an organization that is very much advanced and, and more stable already, you become very comfortable like being or, or working on a very specific a part of, of the overall of what the company does. So I think especially when I moved into or when I moved to Singapore and when I started working in fintech, that was really like being thrown into the cold water and like realizing every single decision A was mine to make. I had to decide what to do in the end. There was no one I could I could refer to, there was no one I could ask for, you know, like, is that okay? Is that would you make that decision too? But it was really there are so many decisions to make every single day and you just need to make them with the best knowledge you have and hope that um, most of them are turning out to be to be the right ones. I think that was the one of the major changes and uh, one of the major challenges, really realizing that you will not always be right, but uh, you just have to, you, you will not be able to have all the information always at hand that you would need or that you would have potentially in a bigger corporation. In a smaller corporation, due to resource constraints and because of everything is changing so fast, take the information you have, make a decision and move on. And then if a decision turns out to be not the right one, then just move on and make it better and fix it. What's interesting is that you've been also having a transition where as a finance professional, you're like raising funding and then you've become more and more of an operator, right? In terms of like leading people, managing, making operational decisions. So tell me more about what that transition is like. I think as well, like uh, yeah, moving away from being only responsible for your own work to, to being responsible for a team and also for motivating them, for understanding what drives them, for understanding what, what their weaknesses and strengths are. That's a, obviously a very, very big shift, even more so when you are not having that that safety net that you have in big corporations where you're being prepared for it and where you you're being coached for it very, very closely. But that I think is a is a transition that for any leader is is one of the most important ones where you move away from being an individual contributor and being praised for, for what you're doing and to actually making sure that your individual contribution is a small part of the overall team's contribution and you need to make sure that your team has everything they need in order to to perform at their best. And I think that's a continuous journey which is not for me, also, is still ongoing, and I'm still questioning uh, my leadership style every single day, and I'm still trying to to find out how I can get better at it. Sounds like you definitely had a lot of learning experience. Were there any personal experiences where you learned those lessons? Yeah, I think when I was the first time that I that I led a team, one of the biggest challenges I think I had was that I expected everyone to to know the same or to start on the same level and with the same information that I had. So I remember like there was this one employee and he was very junior and um, I gave him the brief in a meeting and uh, and uh, he got back to me with something I didn't consider very good work. But instead of sitting down with him and really making sure that I understand where he is coming from, what gaps he had to close, how I can help him to close these gaps, 
I just got very frustrated and I just felt like there's so much going on and I really don't have the time to additionally train the team and coach them and make them get better. And looking back now, I think that was one of the the things that I regret most in my personal leadership journey, because unless the team has the information they they require to really perform at their best, unless you as the leader and I as a leader back then, unless I give them all the information they need and also uh, help them close the gaps, I cannot possibly expect them to, to actually perform at their best. And it creates a lot of frustration, I think, within the team as well, when they feel like there's work thrown at them and they, they are not how, sure how to pick it up or they don't know why it's important and why it's a new priority versus other things that they're already working on. So I think this realization that uh, as a leader, a lot of your time, a very big part of your time, even if you're swamped and even if there are so many things going on for you, a lot of the time you need to spend on just making sure that your team is actually doing the best work that they can. Yeah, I totally resonate with that. I think there are so many moments where I reflect and I was like, oh, I could have done better, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, like <laughs> the way I would lead today is very different from the way I, w- I did lead 10 years ago. And I think there's something that we know a lot about, about how it will change. And I think also in retrospect, I think I was having a reflection that today I'm kind of the leader that I used to respect as a new employee, <laughs> you know, I will come in a new employee. It's like, wow, this manager or this leader is so on top of it and so kind and thoughtful. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's totally unfair because I have now 10 years of experience, right? It's interesting to see that journey play out. So I guess I'm kind of curious, you know, I think, do you feel like there's any differences in how fintech leaders lead differently from, say, other companies? in different verticals? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure whether it's uh, specifically for fintech, but I think a lot of the fintech companies are still relatively early stage. And we are in a, in a time where a lot of the companies want to add fintech as a side business or as a, as a niche to their actual business. So I think what fintechs particularly must do and are currently doing a lot is innovate and really find their their purpose right like why are they there how are they going to be better with other companies that are trying to add this fintech element like amazon and like sea here in in southeast asia so the the companies that have started a fintech that's fintechs i think that's where leadership is critical in terms of okay how do we position ourselves how can we actually help other companies become fintech players, but maybe by offering something that they can use to like a plug and play option, that, that like something they can use to become that uh, fintech company without having to build everything from uh, from scratch themselves. And I think that that fintech play, one of the, the key items about fintech is regulations and being in compliance with everything. Like you're handling customer funds, you're handling yeah, the livelihood of people. So there are regulators that are very concerned about how you do that and what you do. So if you think that you can add fintech just as a side business, you need to hire a lot of people who, who manage it to take care of it. Yeah, that's so true. I never thought about it that way, right? Which is, you're saying that fintech is not just consumer play, but also is very modular. And then there's the regulatory component that is often underweighted. I think for me, from the outside looking in, I find that one big difference that fintech leaders and startups are different is that most of the employees are finance employees, right? (laughs) You know, which is very different, right? I mean, if you look at a lot of like direct-to-consumer brands, obviously they're coming from marketers and so so forth. And if you work at logistics companies, a lot of them come from background in e-commerce or in logistics. But what's interesting about fintech companies, a lot of them come from banks, right? You know, they come from the big banks, the small banks, the, you know, and then everyone's also, um, there's a bunch of finance terminology that I find so interesting. I always like to say like, you know, a million dollars is one buck. And I remember the first one, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, today you know, we're deploying 50 bucks. And I'm like, okay, you don't mean $50 clearly in this context. But <laughs> you know, my brain was like, it's a larger sum. And someone explained to me, it was like, oh, there's a bunch of terminology of like industry inside the language that happens a lot. 
Yeah. I think it's, uh, you're right. A lot of the, the people in fintech are from the finance industry, but I think it's, it's incredibly important to, to have a balance because people from the finance industry, while well, they bring very valuable experience for when you need to, to scale and when you need to, to become like a serious licensed business. But at the same time, the people who are not from the finance industry are the ones that are very critical of every single piece. And they will be the ones that are asking, Do we really need to have to do that? Like, it's a pain for the consumer. It's a pain for the user. Why are we doing it? Do we need to do it? And in a lot of cases, it's like the people coming from the finance industry are like, yes, we need to do it unless we do ABC and we change something. But having this this dialogue and having really people who are critical of the way regulations are done, the way compliance is done is extremely important because otherwise you're just building a second bank. And then that comes with all the frustrations of, being a, a user of a, a, a bank. So you need to have that, that balance really where the one are there to, to make sure the business is protected and the other ones are there to question it and to make sure that it becomes a much better experience. So do you have any tips for how to process manage those meetings between finance and non-finance people? Like how do you like facilitate or moderate a conversation so that it doesn't become like, oh, you're old and fuddy daddy like a bank and no you're going to break the law <laughs> on the other side right how do you uh, get that process going that's also something i think i've, I've i'm still uh, i'm still learning and i'm still really reminding myself every single week i'm trying to listen more and i'm trying to step back note it down try to see you know, are there any service providers already that we can use, right? Like what is the exact regulation saying? Regulations very often are extremely vague. It says you need to do something, but it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do. So taking something that you you know from banking or from other fintech players doesn't necessarily mean that it's a best practice, that you might actually be able to do something uh, smarter. So when you have these meetings, I, I think really that listen take a step back, don't feel offended when, when they question you as a, when they question the people coming from banking, coming from the finance sector, but really take it as an amazing opportunity to, to figure out whether there's something you can really change instead of just copying what, what's already there. And then push back when required, because there will be, there will be instances where you just cannot change it. There's no way around it. <laughs> They need to get over it too. And then it's like within a team, right? Like you just need to have these these conversations where it's like, I wish we could change it. We can't. Find me a better option and we look into it again. But if you can't, let's not waste time going in circles. That's so true. And I think one thing is that, you know, I think people look at a law as a law. And I think people also forget that we also enact new laws, right? And the laws we're making today are often built for an industry and what's moving on over the past five to 10 years, right? And so the reality of business is always moving ahead of the regulations in that cycle and the startups are even further ahead, right? You know, they're planning the, the next vision. So it's really interesting to deal with that dynamic for sure. And I'm just kind of curious because for yourself as well, you know, you've been a founding CEO at a venture builder, and I think they're seeing a lot of growth of, you know, venture builders are now popping up in Southeast Asia. And I think the migration of the idea from, from the U.S. And I'm just kind of curious, what advice would you have for people who are considering whether to join a venture builder, either to be like the founding CEO or to be a co-founder? What should they be thinking about? I think making sure that your visions are aligned with the visions of the venture builder or the the major shareholders um, is the first one. If your visions are not aligned, if you have different ideas of how the business should run, then it can be a very frustrating experience. So first of all, align your visions. Uh, Secondly, make sure you have enough ownership in the company that keeps you motivated for the time it takes to set up a company, to run it, to bring it to a stage where you feel comfortable that... If you had to hand over to someone else now, you you could. But that ownership is really important, A, for making sure that the decisions that you need to do, um, you can make. B, also, especially in the fintech space, if you are responsible for regulations, uh, you need to make sure that you, you can actually influence how a company is set up. 
yeah, and then just what I said earlier, general alignment on on vision and uh, what the company is is meant to do. And that's so true, right? Which is, I find that the more experienced venture builders are much more clear about this, and they're very much upfront to be like, you know, we too also care about the alignment of visions, and we too also care about your ownership being significant. Because it's much more expensive to spend half a year review, and then we both realize it's not working out because we didn't construct it properly. So I think that's something I often tell people who are exploring those roles to also be mindful about the operating history of those venture builders, and to definitely interview their past founders. Right? You know, they should be able to give references to people they worked with or ventures they built. Not just the ones that are successful, but also the ones that have not been successful either because they fell sideways or they didn't scale the way they wanted to. One question I have is that fintech obviously continues to be moving quickly and is also moving very quickly in Southeast Asia. What are the myths and misconceptions that you see in fintech in Southeast Asia? Hmm. So I think one, and not trying to be too critical and it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a uh, thing to say, but like, Singapore and fintech in Singapore is definitely, it's an amazing city to, or it's an amazing country to be in uh, for fintech. But I think the the leading fintechs are still coming from places like the US. Some of them in Europe, you have Revolut, you have Klarna. The US obviously has plenty of them. China is, is obviously an amazing uh, country for, for fintech innovations. So I think for for Singapore, in order to to really grow that player that we have, uh, that, that other countries have, it's important to find a solution for making it easier for these companies to scale regionally, scale across the markets. And I think that's one of the limitations in Southeast Asia is just all the different markets have so many different regulations. And if, if you're a fintech and you want to open bank accounts in different markets, you want to set up in different markets, you have to apply for different markets, uh, different licenses, you have to go through the bank account setup process and all the money laundering questionnaires every single time. It takes a lot of focus away from actually running the business. I think like probably COVID has also shown us about uh, how important is it to have people in, in one market and how much of it can we, can we outsource to, to other markets. So I still strongly believe that it's incredibly important for Singapore to allow foreign talents in and to make sure that we attract attract them and to, to enable companies to hire them from outside if they're not available uh, within Singapore. But I think at the same time, it's much easier now to have distributed teams and still have a functioning a functioning setup and, and still grow and still innovate. And like the last 10 months or so have, have changed that dramatically. So I think it's, it's probably gotten a, bit, a little bit less important to be able to, to hire uh, people here locally and um, because companies have digitalized much, much uh, faster than we thought they would. I think that's really underappreciated as uh, insight. And I think that's explore that further. I too also feel that for countries that have stronger immigration trends around their borders and letting foreign talent in like the US and the UK and here in Singapore, I think obviously there's a conversation in society around how to integrate and how to bring people in and society we have. And in meanwhile, I think businesses just have to double down on this remote work, virtual locations to really be able to scale talent at the same speed as the rest of the business needs them to be. And I think that's great for the business. And I think to some extent that may not be so great for the societies that we want to build, right? So I'm just kind of curious that as you've been hiring and looking at regionally, I know that so many fintech startups are doing the same thing, right? They're looking at regional offices. They're hiring across the region now because they just can't find that talent in Singapore. What best practices do you see in terms of hiring and onboarding do you see for that process? Well, we have been incredibly lucky to have our CTO based in, in India. So he has built, uh, built an office there. Initially, it was mostly for the tech team, but over time we have added more people in, in other teams as well, like operations, finance, uh, compliance, uh, sales as well. And I think that, that one big differentiator is really that a very, very critical team member is actually there with that team as well. So it's not like, you know, 
an office that is far away from where everything is happening, but it's actually a very important office with key team members being there, which made a massive difference. Besides that, we do hire a lot of the roles in Singapore just because I think, yes, it has changed a lot in the last couple of months. We have all become more comfortable with having conference calls. Now everyone knows how to switch on the, the microphone and make sure that it's in the middle of the conference table and that you can actually hear the people, And uh, which wasn't the case even in a fintech company like ours. Very often, it's, people were just not used to it, right? Now we know how to do that. And yet these personal conversations and being able to to easily talk about things also that are not always related to a very specific work to- topic, which if you are based in different markets, you usually uh, get on a call to talk about a very specific topic. So I think these informal conversations are still critical, which is why we hire still a lot of people here in Singapore, or we are still trying to get them in. Um, however, I think what has become easier is like having these people in the satellite offices that make very much sense to have as well. Because if you operate in different markets, you need local talent, you need local content, you need to have the local understanding of the market. And and I think that has been extremely valuable. Yeah, I think there's an interesting observation, which is that there's some serendipity that happens where people can just have that informal conversation. And I think firms are better able to structure that virtually do better. And then, because I think, like you said, the real reality is COVID exists and people are going to be remote. Like, I think so many firms are now irreversibly hybrid from now on, right? You know, it's the moment you start hiring people in settle out offices and every team has someone who's remote. I think it's about how to leverage the strengths and minimize, like you said, uh, the painful points. One thing I'm kind of curious as well is, you know, what do you see in Southeast Asia? I mean, you made the move from Europe to Southeast Asia. What's the choice there? I think if, you know, you, you have an interesting ability to obviously compare and contrast two geographies, right? Mm-hmm. One is Europe and mm-hmm. another is Southeast Asia. So what do you think for the next 10 years? How would you compare and contrast the next 10 years for these two big regions? <laughs> Interesting one. I mean, I guess one of the big differences is Europe is largely banked versus Southeast Asia, where you have like this massive opportunity of the, the underbanked or, or unbanked population, which means you can offer solutions that are completely skipping the, the traditional uh, financial services that we have probably grown up with and have gotten used to. And you can do things that are very different from that. You can offer credit to people that would never get it in the traditional financial industry, for example. One thing, though, and I, I every time I go back to Europe or now also I see the LinkedIn stories, I mean, there are a lot of fintech innovations going on in Europe too. But being Bavarian, every time I go to the Oktoberfest and I see these big signs where it's like only cash, I'm like, how how different just like that willingness to to try different or to pay, pay, pay for for payment options probably and uh, and just use them in, in daily use as right if you can't pay your beer at a an event like the Oktoberfest where speed is important like tapping your card is so much quicker than getting your cash and like tipping the waitress and uh, going through that financial transaction if you can't use it there my opinion is it shows you how different we are in terms of the advancement of of the fintech in day how it penetrates daily life of people here you go to the hawker center and every hawker uh, hawker stall has a couple of different payment options where you can just tap or use pay pay la or all the different options so i think for for the next 10 years a lot of the the solutions that are being developed in europe are still either like a lot of the fintech solutions are for like smaller amounts and like offering more convenience well, here in Southeast Asia, I think it's like that becoming the primary banking partner or becoming the primary, like fintechs become the primary option that are banking a large part of the population that previously just couldn't get access to finance. Well, in Europe, it's like a nice add-on or you do it because it's nicer, it's a better user experience, it's a, it's a, but you still keep your old uh, banking relationship, right? Like people usually still... I mean, I don't know a single person that has completely replaced the the banking relationship. In Southeast Asia, I think a lot of people just didn't have a previous banking relationship. So they are just getting much more comfortable with using fintech companies for for their primary banking needs. So I think 
big difference. And I don't see that changing so much in, in Europe that yet, where people are very concerned about where their money is and who is uh, who is handling it. And I think also scandals like, like the recent Wirecard scandal where a massive company regulated by the German government, a fintech darling, and I mean, I invested as well, right? Because I would never have thought that <laughs> like, that that fraud could could be so bad in a company that big and that was marketed by the German government and supervised by the BaFin, uh, the German regulators. So uh, I think that that trust in banks is still much more important in Europe than it is in other parts of Southeast Asia where people just didn't never had a banking relationship. Yeah, I mean, it's funny thing because, you know, Wirecard has been interesting to watch the fallout. I read some of the short seller reports about Wirecard and, you know, it was kind of a big contrast because you read a lot of short seller reports of Chinese companies who are fortunately not doing so well and you know, some high profile issues, right? Like luck and coffee. But I think nobody really expected the Wirecard to happen because everybody has this archetype of the German regulators, right? You know, big on like rule, the strict on everything, even in the EU. This clearly if it passes the German regulators test, everyone is just gonna sign off on this, right? So so I, how do you feel about I guess investing in it? And obviously it's been a huge uh, champion for FinTech and global globally, right? I, I don't believe so much in feeling embarrassed on behalf of a whole nation, but I did feel a bit embarrassed uh, that all of that was going on and uh, and it was not picked up by anyone, right? Like there were there were auditors, there were the German regulators. And uh, I just would never have thought that it could have been, it would be so bad. And Viacard was everywhere, right? Like in every store you or in, in a lot of the stores you paid when you looked at the receipt, it was Viacard in Southeast Asia, but also in, in Europe. So I think it showed again that regulations, even with, what we are doing and even with the licenses that governments are handing out they can just do so much supervising like uh, it, it shows i think for me it showed even more the importance of as a fintech company understanding why you are being regulated why these regulations are there in the first place and i think the the aim is to protect consumers to protect the company like make sure that it can continue to operate that there's no excessive risk taking that you don't understand yeah protect the money of your customers and uh, of your shareholders and everyone so and then basically act in the best interest for all these different stakeholders involved because regulators will not be able to protect you from yourself <laughs> so they, they might not even be aware of of what you're doing because for them it's very often like ticking off some boxes right and then also Different parties relying on each other, like probably the auditors relying on the regulators, the regulators relying also on the auditors and employees not questioning it because there might have also been a, a culture of secrecy potentially around these these items. And we have seen that in other companies. I mean, you mentioned Luckin, but then there's also one of the greatest books I've ever read was Theranos because uh, the the story about Theranos because it read uh, read like a thriller right and it was like how can so many smart people not have picked up on it but it was like because there was always this assumption okay it's not for me to question there are other people like if the regulators if if all these other great people don't see anything like wrong with it then it's probably all good and it's just me worrying unnecessarily all right, last question. So tell me, obviously, there's a lot of people who are looking to move to Southeast Asia. You know, I recently got pinged from five different friends <laughs> to Europe, or moving to Southeast Asia. Do you have any tips or advice for them about what they should be aware of? Well, first of all, which country they would pick? Because I think the, the Asia light uh, country is Singapore. You have a lot of experts here. It's a very small country, so you can meet a lot of them. You never really feel out of place. You never stick out too much. And it's a very easy place to, to fit in. I previously lived in Malaysia, which was very different because you do stick, depending on how you look, you do stick out. You have people take pictures of you, asking for pictures of you. And uh, like these situations where you feel like it's it's very, very different. And also the business culture is very, very different than in Singapore. Singapore is extremely 
transparent and uh, especially in the fintech sector you need a license you know how how the, what the process is in other countries in the region that might not be the the case so i think if you want to move to this region first question how much you actually want to go out of your comfort zone if you want to get the experience but with a very nice and easy lifestyle and also in a business environment that is very similar to other markets then do it in singapore if you are in your 20s and you really want to get the full-on experience and you don't mind at all like living in a city where you commute one and a half two hours three hours every day then go to jakarta or go to one of the places where a lot is happening in terms of tech because you're just leapfrogging or they're just skipping like uh, through innovations and they're just doing things completely different so personally i think the younger you are the more you should probably think about moving to to indonesia to thailand to malaysia to whatever the older you are you might be more comfortable in singapore awesome thank you so much for coming aboard thank you jeremy <laughs>